Hi, we're Mike and Jennifer Wenlin, and welcome to episode 350 of the RV Podcast. This week, we talk about the camping crisis of 2021. Welcome, fellow travelers. It's time for another episode of the RV Podcast. Answering your questions, sharing tips, suggesting great trips and off the beaten path adventures, and always staying on top of the RV lifestyle news you need to know about with great interviews and inside industry information. Here's your hosts, award winning journalists Mike and Jennifer Wendland. We'll be looking at one of the overlooked reasons why it's so hard to get a camping spot. Yeah, it's a mess out there, as we're going to share in this podcast. We're also going to expose a little-known secret that is literally sweeping the camping industry, which is going to mean higher prices for campsites. And I don't know what else to say except that it's because of the greed of the corporations that are now taking over many of our campgrounds. So we got a lot to talk about this weekend. Most of it related to what we're calling the camping crisis of 2021. The easy explanation for it is that this year they're expecting anywhere from 63 million to 62 million campers. They've never had numbers that high ever. Uh, And that's why it is so crowded. But we've reported on that before. We want to talk about a couple of other issues. One has to do with campers who have reservations and then they just don't show up. They don't cancel. They don't call the campground. They don't go online and pull their reservation. They just don't show up. And this is a big problem, bigger than I think many of you think. And the other has to do with major corporations buying up campgrounds and Sometimes making them better, adding to, making them good. That's good. That's a good part. The flip side is that you're going to pay for that. And they're buying these to make a profit. So they're doing it through something called dynamic pricing. Now, you may never have heard of that term before, but it's really the law of supply and demand. You've experienced probably if you've ever booked a hotel room and then they say, well, let me check before I give you the final okay. And then when you call back, you find it's higher. Right. And just like some nights of the week, or if they know there's a convention in town and the demand is going to be higher, you pay more. So the same thing is starting to happen in our campgrounds. Essentially what it means is they can charge whatever they want, whenever they want, and they are doing so. We're going to dig into that in the interview of the week. That's coming up in just a couple of minutes. But first of all, we want to share what we have been doing this past week. And uh, we're going to also have some of your comments and suggestions. But we got a little announcement that we want to share. Actually, it's a big announcement for us. We're really excited about it. You ready? We need a da-da-da-da. Yeah, da-da-da-da. Or a drum roll. Look what we have. The Complete Guide to Boondocking, the print edition. You've been asking for it. We've been promising it. And it is done hot off the press. 116 plus pages. uh, They'll help you find campsites. Forget the crowded campgrounds that you can't get in. This is about boondocking, how to get out there, stay out there off the grid. We're really excited about it. We've got an ebook on this and have had that we update regularly. But this is uh, by popular demand. It's a paperback size and it is a paperback. Nice cover. Nice titles, uh, index, links, all the stuff that you've asked us to put in, and it's available right now. That's where you can get it. There's a link there on the on the uh, screen for those of you who are watching on YouTube. Uh, We'll put it in the show notes Uh, for those of you listening uh, on the uh, podcast. You'll find it on the show notes page at uh, rvlifestyle.com. But the book is done. It is ready. This is our first official announcement, and uh, can you tell we're a little excited about it? Yeah, we're really excited about it. So uh, again, it's uh, it's 19.95, and uh, there it is. You can take it with you, and uh, we're pretty excited about it. We'll tell you more about it a little bit later on. But um, we just got back from a camping trip ourselves. Yeah, we decided to go camping along Lake Huron because we needed to take some pictures for our next ebook that's Our, coming out soon the, the great lake shoreline tours are going to be released in just a, a few days now and 
and we boy did we luck out we had good weather mm. beautiful campsites it was very relaxing and very nice but we also learned a lot on that trip now we knew that it was going to be a little tricky to get campgrounds so we checked we checked six different campgrounds around uh, the Lake Huron shoreline and they were all full. We kept having to go north, go north, go north. Go north. And then we realized, you know, we're going to only go during the week from, uh, we wanted to go from Tuesday till Friday, if we could Tuesday, Friday, Saturday. And we juggled around and we juggled around and we we got into a, a couple of campgrounds, state parks, but we couldn't, we strung two days together, but that was it. We couldn't do it. We couldn't figure out why, because we were walking around the campground and we said, well, we can get one of those sites. Look at all these empty sites. And we went and um, we said, well, can we get there's a site right on the water? It's been it, empty for four days. You it know? was empty for four days and it was just this beautiful site. So we had to ask the park ranger if we could have that site. And then he explained to us that when you make multiple day reservation, they'll hold it for two days nights for you two days if you don't show up if you don't hold show it. up but this one they've been holding it for four days but he called the people and the people said yes they were coming now they whether they were... really came or not i don't know but and he did say that there was a slight fee that the state park charges if you don't come but that slight fee might put a couple more bucks in the for the state of michigan but all the campers that would have loved this beautiful spot right on the water including us you know, it just isn't, it isn't fair. Now we saw, we guess, I would guess 25% uh, maybe uh, were empty. Right. And uh, when we, we talked to different people who worked at the park, they all said, oh, yeah, those are the no shows. Everybody knows that we have to keep them for two days. And they said, this is common practice in the industry. And since that we've learned it is in many places. Uh, it is just ridiculous. I mean, absolutely ridiculous. And, and the fact that this, the guy said, the ranger said, yeah, we're going to make some more money on it. The state, they're, they're going to have to pay a fee. Well, who cares? That's, you know, it's, it's good for your business. I mean, these but, campgrounds are for all of us. Yeah. And not uh, just the people in the state of Michigan, but for all of us. I mean, there's reasons people have to cancel, but pick up the phone and let somebody know, you know, that's the thing. And it's not just us that's and we've experiencing been this. hearing from you. You have been letting us know of how frustrated you have been out there trying to find a campsite. Here's here's a here's a note we got from one of our uh, our listeners, our followers, uh, uh, named Sadie, and Sadie uh, wrote to say, "I stayed at several Forest Service campgrounds last month. Many spots were reserved for blocks of time, but sat empty during the reservation period. I think it's selfish for people to reserve blocks of time and not show up." I believe people reserve in multiple campgrounds on the same night, so they have a backup. The fees at Forest Service campgrounds are so minimal that it's not a financial burden for people to reserve and no-show. It's really discouraging. It is discouraging. And, uh, you know, it's just so rude, just plain rude. And then we have another one on a related topic. Amy Z wrote to say, there are campers that are uh, booking packing, driving, and then arriving only to find the reservation is no good. And the campground is in fact full due to overbooking. This is not a good way to make up for income loss realized during the pandemic. I plead with RV parks to gain our confidence back. And then there's this note, just to show you that this is happening all across the country. This is from Kim and she was in the Pacific Northwest and she writes, Washington state is reservation only. Usually I have to book three to six months to even get a spot at a popular state park. I've been trying to book a spot at Leavenworth, Washington for over two years. This is a big nationwide problem. And this uh, overbooking thing that we heard about, I mean, that's a direct result of People, no shows of people not showing up or canceling because kind of like an airline they know that so many such a percentage are not going to show up so they overbook because their job is to get that money in their coffers and also i think they sincerely want people to use the sites to camp and this is even happening with harvest host yeah yeah we we stayed and that's how we were able to really get our vacation last week going as we supplemented our stays in state parks at harvest host and frankly, the Harvest Host sites were fantastic. Were better. We couldn't have had a better site. We would have paid 
top dollar for them. They were gorgeous sites, and we'll, we'll be doing a video on that uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks to show you. But the Harvest Host Campgrounds, we asked them, you know, we love to meet the people who are hosts, and that's half the fun of Harvest Hosts. And they all said they have the same problem with no-shows. Mm -hmm. They said that they just don't show up. And uh, the one place that we went to said that she had an awkward situation. She owns a restaurant and they have a couple of places you can plug in electricity to camp. And that she got a call from her insurance agent who told her. He that happened to be eating dinner at her restaurant eating dinner that night. At her restaurant, called her up and said, you could lose your insurance because there are two pit bulls running around in your parking lot. <laughs> And without a leash, without, without a, a leash. leash, you know, and that's part of camping code, camping or uh, part of the camping code of ethics for staying at a harvest host is you always have your dog on a leash. And uh, another part of that is their code of ethics is that you have to cancel. And if not, they're going to penalize you. In fact, just this week, they, they sent out a note. They sent out a notice to all their people saying failure to cancel a harvest host reservation and not calling to cancel is a violation of the Harvest Host Code of Ethics. And they have sent notices to their members that three no-shows with no cancellation will result and they're gonna they're gonna terminate your privileges of harvest host. They pull and, your membership. They they rev revoke your membership. And they're not gonna give you back your money that you paid for your yearly fee either. All right. So that's a big part of the camping crisis of 2021. No shows, people who don't cancel uh, and of course, you know, obviously so many people going camping, but the other part that we're going to talk about in a little bit later on our interview of the week has this is about this corporatization of camping, getting rid or buying up all these mom and pop, uh, operations. And that's don't just hear us out when we do the interview. It's not necessarily bad that part, but then there's this whole issue of this supply and demand pricing that changes all the time. That's coming up in the interview of the week. When we come back in a minute, it's going to be the news of the week. Stay with us. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And Battleborn batteries are protected by a 10-year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have. And they'll probably be the same on your rig, too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Let's talk about protecting your RV from the elements. And the best way we know how to do that is with empirecovers.com, makers of quality covers for your RV that will protect them from rain, mud, pollen, and other elements that you have to waste your time cleaning or worse that can end up damaging your vehicle. Whether you own an RV, a travel trailer, or a camper, EmpireCovers.com is here to help you protect all your vehicles against Mother Nature. They offer high-quality, affordable covers that are engineered to protect every cover. Comes with a free warranty to guarantee it remains durable. The RV podcast listeners can receive free shipping plus an extra 15% off their entire order. Visit them at EmpireCovers.com slash RV Lifestyle. EmpireCovers.com slash RV Lifestyle. EmpireCovers.com. Protect what you love. Welcome back to the News of the Week segment. Do you ever wonder what campers are really looking for when they book a reservation? Well, what they're looking for may surprise you. A recent study that analyzed more than 20,000 reservations at 179 popular campsites at Watchman Campgrounds in Zion National Park sought to answer that question. Researchers found an affordable price and access to electricity were the two most important factors in choosing a campsite, followed by accessibility located near a beautiful national attraction 
and close, but not too close to a bathroom. Researchers hope the study will help the government design campgrounds that people really want. This is a sad story from, um, there's a, there's a warning to us all out of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and has to do with a 16 year old girl who was camping with her family in the park and she was asleep in a hammock outside when she was attacked by a black bear. Now the girl suffered multiple injuries, including some of them to the head. The bear actually grabbed her by the head. Her uh, family saw this and they scared off the, 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 the bear. Uh, the girl was evacuated out and she's uh, now in a stable condition in a, in a hospital and she's gonna be okay. Um, but then the bear came back after the rangers were there with the family and the family says, there it is. So the bear that uh, attacked her was shot and he was killed and they did find uh, human blood in its uh, mouth. Um, as a result, several campgrounds in the area of the attack remain closed over the past weekend. And while the family, by all accounts, was doing everything it could, they weren't doing anything wrong, uh, it's, a, it's a warning to all of us that when you are in bear country, you have to behave a certain way. And that's, that's one of the things we write about in our, um, in our boondocking book, now available as a print edition. <laughs> and uh, it, this... Uh, Lots of, of uh, tips about boondocking in bear country and images and tips. And one of the things that uh, you should know about is that there's a difference in how you act with a grizzly bear and a black bear. You can't know too much in how to handle a, situ a situation or how to avoid a situation. Grizzly bears, you wanna back off slowly, confidently, don't run, but get out of there, slowly back off. Don't run though. Don't run. Don't run with any bear. Yeah. And with a black bear, make yourself big, make a lot of noise, throw stones. It's okay to be, try to be big and aggressive and scare them away. Yeah. And uh, one of the things you should never do is drop your pack because that's where your food is. And it teaches bear to uh, attack people. And then they're going to get this uh, bag Free full lunch. of goodies. So uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it's interesting. So, uh, learned about it. Uh, always have bear spray. Uh, it's effective for grizzlies and for black bears. Uh, most of you won't even see a bear, but when you don't expect it, you will. We were leading a small group on a hike in Glacier a couple of years ago. I mean, it was a short, I don't, think it, was, walk. I don't think it was a, any more than maybe a quarter mile along a lake shore. By a hotel. <laughs> By a hotel, yeah. And uh, man, there. first we saw a moose and her calf. They can be very dangerous. And then we saw stalking the moose and a calf of, of grizzly. And we learned later that the grizzly had eaten one of the, the moose calves a, a day before. And um, we had no place to go. We couldn't get out. We did have bear spray. The bear did not come towards us. He eventually left. But I guess my point in that is be really aware that you're going to find bear, and then we remember not that have seen a bear. Then I mean, we always was... find bear in Glacier, though. Remember yes, the we hike did. we took? Yeah, uh, we had a little hike, and we ran across a mom and her cub, yeah. uh, like two feet from us. Oh, <laughs> we were yeah, we were on a trail, and out of the brush came first. We saw a, a bear cub, and I figured, and oh, it was dear. like ten feet from us. And it was oh, very no, close because we knew a cub that small, mama, and then there came mama and. Uh, Jennifer w started to talk and she said something. What did it's you totally say? Ridiculous. Like the hiss, the hippopotamus crossed the road to get to the other side of the street. And I'm sitting there thinking that's a bear. That's not a hippopotamus, <laughs> but she was talking calmly following the directions and we were backing up. And don't ask me why I said that. I have no <laughs> idea other than I was like, Oh boy, we're in trouble. I got to say something softly. To let the mama know we're here. She gave I mean, us, we're not growling or anything. She kind of gave us a stink eye. And I was very tempted to take a couple of pictures, but we just backed away. And then they moved away and we could see them. Uh, they were eating berries off the off the hiking trail. But uh, And then we got our pictures from a distance. But it, it, the point is, is you don't know where they are, uh, you know, and, and they it can go very bad very fast. So take a look at uh, your surroundings and know what to do in bear country. All right. Uh, last story we want to talk about, and we hope this is not a trend. Mm. This happened in Idaho and uh, uh, officials there get this. They're charging out of state campers twice what they're charging in state residents at some of its state parks. The price of 48 bucks. If you're from another state, 
$24 if you live in Idaho. And the state admits that they're getting a lot of object objections from non-residents to which they say unapologetically tough. Tough. And uh, boy, we hope that doesn't happen across the country. I mean, if you think that that's discrimination, you're absolutely right. They, it is, and they admit it. They want out of state people to stay home. Uh, we did look up the statistics of Priest Lake, which is one of the uh, campgrounds where they have this in effect, where they've doubled the rate for out of, out of state residents. And last year, 47,000 out of state residents visited. H how many were in state? Just 21,000 in state people. So you can see. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, a it's a slippery slope because the people who live in the state want to visit their state parks. And people out of state are traveling and they want to visit too. So I just hope this isn't a trend. That's all I can say. All right. We come back the interview of the week and we talk more about the camping crisis of 2021. We talk about the corporatization of campgrounds and we talk about this sort of on demand dynamic pricing that's going to have you paying more for campsites this year. Stay with us. All RVers need specialized emergency transportation coverage to cover air and ground ambulances, return to home services, and vehicle return. You only have a 68% chance that those services will be completely covered by your major medical. The sad reality is that a lot of people believe they have that coverage, but it turns out most carriers that claim to cover air ambulances only cover you for a hospital to hospital transfer and offer no coverage to get you to the initial hospital in the first place. The truth is 68% of air ambulances are hospital to hospital. Here's a map of all the places in the U.S., that getting to the hospital in the golden hour is not possible without an air ambulance. And with an average cost of $52,481 for an air ambulance, why would you take the risk? Go to peaceofmindforrvs.com today and take a look at the true emergency transportation coverage they offer that covers it all. The coverage can save your life and your life savings. Check it out, peaceofmindforrvs.com. Jennifer and I are members, and we urge you to consider it too. Peace of mind for RVs.com. Hey, fellow travelers. Want to have your voice featured on the RV podcast? Send us your questions or comments. Send an audio file to Mike at RVLifestyle.com. Or better yet, use our RV podcast voicemail number, 586-372-6990. 586-372-6990. We want to hear from you. Call 586-372-6990. Have you had it with overbooked, overcrowded campgrounds? Then check out Harvest Hosts, where RVers can overnight for free at more than 2,400 wineries, farms, microbreweries, golf courses, and attractions. Harvest Host is a membership service for those with self-contained RVs looking for unique, beautiful, and peaceful overnight camping experiences across North America. When you become a member of Harvest Host, you can camp for free at all these places. Jennifer and I are Harvest Host members, and we've made so many great memories at Harvest Host locations. There's no charge for camping, and your Harvest Host membership fee is easily made up with just a couple of stays. Plus, you have awesome places to stay. If you use our special affiliate link of rvlifestyle.com slash HH, you'll automatically get 15% off the cost of your membership. That's 15% off, but you must use the special link, rvlifestyle.com slash HH. Welcome back, everybody. And now the interview of the week. It's getting harder and harder to find campsites. You ever wonder why? And during the middle of the week, when it used to be easy to get a campsite, it's not even easy then. It is a camping crisis, and it needs to be addressed. Like everything this year, it's complicated. Um, as we said earlier, there are more campers than we've ever seen before. But the result is it's almost impossible to get a campsite most weekends during the summer, now even into the fall. Many even next next summer are already booked up on popular weekends. So the problem is severe. But there are two things happening that you need to know about. One of them is the increasing corporatization of campgrounds. This is happening very fast all over the country. 
The mom and pop campgrounds are being bought up by the big corporations and a corporation buys it to improve the grounds and also to take advantage to get as much money as they can. I mean, that's their purpose to make money. So what's happening is these corporations are basically uh, using something called dynamic pricing. And it has to do with the program, uh, the data that they uh, can access through their reservation system. Uh, most of these reservation systems have kept track of you whenever you make a reservation, what kind of a rig you have, how long you stay, what kind of things you buy, all that kind of stuff. And they also keep track of demand. So as a result of that, the prices can change. A $35 campsite can suddenly be a $60 campsite. So we wanted to learn more about this. And uh, I think I think we've got an interview that's going to help us put this in perspective. Yeah, if you think about like hotel rooms, how certain nights of the week it's uh, cheaper, but like Thursday night, Friday, it keeps going up every day as you get closer to the weekend. Because more people are using because it. Because more people are using it. So they're going to get as much money as they can. Yeah. Uh, in some corporate, in some hotels, it's exactly the opposite because they cater to the business community. Biggest day there is Sunday night. Uh, so, you know, most of the business people go home. So on uh, Friday night and Saturday night, it's fairly cheap. And then Sunday night, they gouge you and they hold it up. To, it, you know, well, they're just trying to make money. But as a result, the whole ambiance of camping is changed and it's hard to get a price. So in our interview of the week, we're going to talk with a friend of ours named Mike Gast. Mike is a former executive with Campgrounds of America. He worked for them many, many years. He knows the camping industry inside and out. He's now working as a managing editor for RVTravel.com. And um, we asked Mike to sit down with us and help us understand just what's happening that's uh, uh, apart. What's the background to this camping crisis that we're all facing here in 2021? Let's start off with what's happening uh, as a result of this RV boom that we've been seeing, I guess, and all the money to be made. Let's start talking about what's happening across the country involving campgrounds and, and big corporations buying them up. Well, it's, it's gotten a lot of attention in the last few weeks. There are a lot of campgrounds in the market right now. Uh, it's been a great time for uh for the mom and pop operations, we'll call them, uh, the smaller campgrounds that have been in operation for several years. The market's really ripe right now for turnover and change. So uh, anytime, anytime that there's money to be made out in that market, uh, you're obviously going to have some turnover. What's happened, I think, recently uh, that I've been observing is that their the prices have gone up. They've jumped like everything else has. And all of a sudden, the campground that may have been purchased for a little less than a million dollars several years ago is now selling for over $3 million. Well, that automatically shaves the market down so that it's a lot more difficult for a, a small family to get in to a campground with 50 or 60 or 70 sites. Uh, but if it's got enough land around it, enough unused land, it becomes very attractive to a, a group or a corporation that can, can jump in there with the resources and finance the purchase themselves and have that land to develop. Uh, and it's really one of the only ways that we're gonna get out of this shortage of, of RV sites that we're experiencing, because uh, you gotta have the capital to expand these parks. And some of the families that are operating small parks just don't have that much immediate accessible capital to quickly and rapidly expand those campgrounds and get more sites. So in, in that sense, uh it's not necessarily a bad thing for our viewers because uh, the only way you say that these, some of these campgrounds are grow is to have that influx of capital, which, you know, the mom and pop operators can't. So I guess in a sense, that part's good, right? Yes. I, I wrote a story a couple of weeks ago in rvtravel.com there where I said exactly that same thing. I, I, I really am torn about it because it is uh, the essence of camping is that small out in the woods, uh, get away from it all small campground uh, run by again a, a mom and pop uh, a small family uh, that's making their one living off of that place and that is nostalgia that's the way camping started is i i have the long career with koa campgrounds of america and and uh, the majority of those parks 20 years ago were that that small family owned operation owned and operated by the folks that were behind the counter uh you hate to lose that 
uh, by any means that is developed into camping as we know it. But now camping as we know it is changing. The amenities that are being demanded, the, the food services, what the camper expects uh, as far as an experience when they get there with uh, activities and all those, you know, the, the big giant resort pools that they'd like. Uh, all, that's, all that's evolved and it's become very attractive and very lucrative for, for companies to come in there. Uh, or, or groups with resources to come in, purchase these campgrounds and develop them to what the campers say they want. I read an article in RV Travel that was written by uh, Andy Zipser, who is uh, was a campground owner, a well-known guy in the East Coast. And he talked about how his sold for, I think, $4 million, something like that. and mm -hmm. uh, Or he know a, a campground near him sold for about that. And then uh, like a year later, the corporation flipped it at like three times that rate. And, and uh, I guess there is money to be made by, you know, kind of flipping campgrounds. Well, and the, the big, again, the big lure on that specific instance in, in Andy's neighborhood was the fact that that campground had a lot of unused land around it. It had a great big belt of land that was ripe for development. And the, the obviously these corporations come in, these groups come in with revenue and they decide that they want to, uh, work in that they get they get all the county it's already a campground so it's a little bit easier to expand into the available land and they have the capital to quickly do that add more sites and and again add the revenue so that's what's happening when these smaller campgrounds get bought up for what seems like a, a an unreasonable amount of money it certainly is going up quickly it's certainly desirable there's a lot of new money flowing into camping right now and uh, most of that is coming from groups or corporations that have that sort of revenue. Now with that comes a different way of doing business. And that takes us to the thing that I think most RVers are going to be particularly concerned about. And um, this is this thing called dynamic pricing. Now I've taken a stab at trying to explain it. We're kind of familiar with it, but you can explain this much better. First of all, what, what is dynamic pricing? And then how, how is that being played out? Um, in the campground reservations, campground booking fees. A dynamic pricing is really nothing new. It's, it's probably been around in some form or fashion for a decade now. If you've ever ridden an Uber or a Lyft car, uh, that's dynamic pricing. They call it surge pricing there. It's a way to uh, automatically control inventory, you know, the supply and demand chain. So if you've got, uh, in the case of Uber, if you've got a lot of de a demand at, a say, a professional baseball game that's getting out and everybody wants to leave at the same time, Uber does surge pricing. They'll automatically raise the price. That draws in more drivers to increase the inventory of drivers so that the crowd, the customer, <clears throat> excuse me, the customer can quickly get out now. So the customer's happy, even though they're paying more to get out. The drivers are happy because they're making more money all of a sudden. And, and they use it as a way of, of doing that. Uh, it's a little bit different. And again, it's, this is nothing new. Amazon has been doing this to us for probably five or six years now. Sure. In a, and that would explain way. why we why we check a, a computer uh, one day and we go back to buy it uh, an hour later and the price is, is different. So I Absolutely. We've seen that. Uh, hotel rooms, it seems to me, we see that all the time. Uh, another great example is the airline industry. Uh, if you yeah. actually turn to the guy next to you and asked you what he paid for his seat, it's nine times out of 10 going to be much different than what you paid for that because the airlines know how often you fly. They know what type of flyer you are. They know whether it's a business or a leisure trip. They know all this about you. Uh, it, that's what's coming into the camping industry. It's, it's a, it's a way of maximizing the potential revenue on a campground uh, absolutely for the benefit of the owner. But again, it's, it's not always a bad thing. It, it the camping industry used to have a fixed prices on sites. You know, the, the site would be $30, $30 a night way back for the full service RV site. That was it. Didn't matter whether it was a pull through, didn't matter whether it was uh, uh, water. It might be a difference between water, electric and full service. But if it was a full service, full hookup site, it had a single price. You know, we used to print that in the KOA directory as a single price. Didn't matter what day of the week it was, didn't matter what time of day it was, didn't matter who you were or what they knew about you. Well, now uh, companies, and not just companies, even the mom and pops that are buying into these systems, 
have uh, have all this data at, at their disposal. They know how much you've camped with them. They know what size rig you have. They know how many people you camp with. Uh, they know where you're from. So they know all this information so that they can, they can help determine uh, ability to pay, what your tolerance for payment is. Uh, again, and then they, they match that against their inventory. It gets very complex in the camping business because there's so many factors involved here. We've got, uh, again, the, the service is part of it. They've got what size rig do you have? Is it a fifth wheel? Is it a pull trailer? Is it a pop-up? Uh, all these different factors have to get put into these algorithms that drive this type of pricing model. So it's this collection of data that the, and you say these systems, these are the, uh, computer reservation systems that are being sold to campgrounds. And there's five or six big ones out there mm -hmm. and they all use you know, <laughs> all that data from all that camping, probably every time you've booked it, it's in there. So, but, but here's where I guess I, I would, I would wonder about it. So my camping is just say we come into a site and we tend to stay a night or two at the most. And uh, you know, we cook our own meals and, and uh, that's about it. Uh, whereas someone uh, else who is would like that same spot, you know, they stay for a week and they eat food and they uh, use all of the facilities and buy all the upsells that many of the campgrounds have. That algorithm is then going to give the edge to that person, is it not? Instead of the guy who it's like a Vegas hotel room. They they comp the room if you spend enough, but it's going well, to give the edge to somebody else, isn't it? I think you'd have to be a real victim of timing in order to get to get taken by that scenario. Because uh, if you're the first one in to try to book the site, they're not going to hold it back necessarily and wait for the for the for the high roller to come in and book that site. They're going to take your reservation uh, because it's a sure thing. Now they'll try to maximize the potential off of that. And the, again, this has been going on for a long time. Camp Spot, for instance, has been out in the market uh, for for a long, long time. They they run most of the systems for for leisure systems, which are Yellowstone Jellystone parks. Uh, so they've got a, a wide base already. That so campers have been running into this for for quite a while. It's uh it's kind of like if you've ever seen a, a campground owner's reservation grid it kind of looks like a tetris game where they're moving people from site to site uh trying to maximize the potential because there's another factor in there how long are you staying that you just brought up if you've got one person that's trying to get uh your best site your bet your most lucrative site for two nights and another person comes in and they're willing to book it for five nights that's the more lucrative customer to you so again timing being a factor you're going to give it to the guy that's going to book it for five nights because then you don't have to worry about it but maybe the guy that wanted it for two nights, well, maybe he can have it for the for the one night that they don't overlap, and then he's got to move. So the system will try to offer him another option in order to uh, to keep him in the in the group there. So all this happens automatically and it happens very quickly. It's uh, and the pricing model follows along with that. So campers are going to see uh, a lot of variables put into their into their. Pricing model. If you're trying to get in on the Fourth of July, well, this year you're you're pretty much taken anyway. I saw KOA just put out last week that they're nationwide, not just KOA campgrounds, but they're expecting 20 million people out there camping this this Fourth of July weekend, yeah. which is a, a astounding number to me. It's just a, a lot of folks out there. Well, you can't find a place on a commercial campground to camp on the Fourth of July, but the weekends filled up. Uh, one of the new things that we we're seeing now is most of the weekends are full, uh, or at least uh, at every, the desirable locations. Every right. And we so, went and we went camping last week, and I was unable to find anything except a single night here and there at four mm -hmm. different campgrounds we tried. Uh, we were going this week, and I spent three hours yesterday trying to find one or two nights during the week that were open, and nothing. Nothing. We're, we're so we this, are in a time. A yeah, we are time. in a very, very strange time, a very strange little, uh, again, it's it's all supply and demand economics. If uh, if the supply is short, like it is right now, uh, the demand goes up. If the demand goes up, the price goes up. And uh, again, I, I get torn in this conversation because campers, we all want more opportunities to camp. And with the crowds that are, are into camping now, when all these millions are giving this a try, 
uh, there just aren't any sites out there. And the only, the only, you know, if, if they, if they remain in camping, they've made the, they've made a huge investment in their equipment now with new RVs. If they remain in camping, the only answer to that is more sites to expand the current parks, to build new parks. And that all takes time. So it's going to take a long time to adjust the market of demand or of supply to meet demand or better meet demand. And in the meantime, the supply uh, or the demand for the, that short supply drives that price up. It's just it's just the way economics works. And so for a while, it is going to be tough. Well, let me let me ask you as we wind this down. Uh, I have increasingly uh, come to the conclusion that I think we are about ready to see another change in the market. I am sensing widespread frustration, anger uh, by RVers, by campers who can't get a place. Um, they are finding uh, it just so much work to to really live that lifestyle that they've been sold when they bought that RV. That I think we're going to see uh, a whole bunch of new, of used RVs coming on the market soon. And I wonder what long term effect this is going to have because the industry seems to have been spending all of their time. This is just my opinion: making money, selling more, selling more, selling more, and now they. They can't provide more. They're all tapped out. We saw Thor say they were sold out for what, uh, three years or two years or next year, whatever it is. Uh, what effect is all of this and now the dynamic pricing? What effect do you think? Do you see it having an effect on the consumer, the RV or the camper out there? Well, I can tell you that for the first time in, the, in my experience in 20 years in this business, I'm seeing a better connection between uh, the big suppliers of camping, the KOA, the leisure systems, and some of those other independents that are out there with the industry. I, I think the, the RV manufacturing industry is starting to listen to some of the people that are actually operating the parks. You got to remember that uh, a vast majority of, of the current campgrounds out there were built way back in the 60s and 70s and maybe at the early 80s. They've been around for a long time. They were built in such a way where Nobody thought about uh, even a pull through at the time. And they certainly didn't think about things like slide outs when they were designing campgrounds. Uh, where were the services put? How much room between the sites? You get to some of those, those older parks. And again, I'll bring up the game Tetris. When, when people started pushing those slide outs out in both directions, some of those sites got really tight. Yeah. Well, the, the campgrounds yeah. weren't made for the current market of RV. They're, they've evolved over the last 10, 15 years. As sites have gotten bigger, as the demand for patio sites has increased, all that has affected the way a campground looks and the way a campground operates. It took some time, but the, the campground industry flexed to meet what the RV market was doing and what, and what campers were demanding. And I think we're in a, into a period of that now uh, where there is an awful lot of, of new new machines out there. There's just a lot of new equipment on the road and campgrounds are going to flex again to meet that. And sometimes it's, it's physically flexing with more sites. Uh, again, it takes a lot of time to adjust to that. And I think that the, as we go forward here, the, the manufacturing side will start listing a little bit closer to the, to the campground supplier side as to how fast things are going, uh, what the options are, because it, it really is, uh, you hit a wall. You hit a wall eventually if all these people don't get anywhere near the experience that they were expecting when they buy it. Then just as you predicted, there will be a lot of RVs on the market because if somebody's looking at an RV as an affordable vacation option and all of a sudden they realize they only got to use it two weekends last summer and yet they paid the insurance and they paid the payment and they paid the storage and, and whatever maintenance is required, that doesn't become a very affordable option for a couple of, uh, you know, for four or five nights a year. It is. Well, uh, Mike, these are big issues, a lot more complicated than, than just picking up the phone and saying, oh, I can't get a, a spot this weekend. But uh, uh, I hope we don't hit that wall. But for the first time in the 10 years now that we've been uh, on the road ourselves, uh, I've never sensed so much frustration uh, from people out there. Uh, that's why we like boondocking. We <laughs> we still can find places to boondock, but uh, it's not for everybody. So Well, no, and, and I think those are going to get to be 
they're under pressure too. I mean, the Walmarts oh, yeah. in the world, uh, they're, they're going to be less and less places to, to boondock as we know it too, because uh, it's just so much pressure. There's so many different kinds of campers out there. I know Chuck Woodbury at RV Travel wrote a column last weekend about kind of talking about what camping's what camping is, what, what is RVing anymore? Is the, is the, the homeless person who's living in an RV on a city street? Are they a camper? Uh, is the, is the person with a 40 foot RV with heated floors and all the bells and whistles and they, they never really step out of their rig. Is that, a, is that a camper? Uh, there's such a wide array that gets serviced by these, by these properties and by this industry that it's it's really hard to to visualize what's coming next in in this in this industry now I, i'm sure a lot of folks are going to question whether this is something they want to continue but again i think it's an industry in evolution and campers uh, the the campground industry is always going to try to meet the demands of the camper and uh they're just in, in this period right now where we kind of got caught you know we had a uh, a few months completely shut down last year, and now it's exploded again. And it's very hard to match that sort of explosive demand. Now, how long does this last? I don't know, a year, a year and a half. I mean, according to uh, the folks at Thor, that's how long it's going to take for them to to get back to supplying dealers with a with an adequate supply. Well, they're making RVs as fast as they can with the supply chain limitations they've got, but they're still cranking out RVs to people that are pre purchase these things. Uh, it's it's going to be a while before you see a lot of RVs flooding back onto lots and, and things appear normal again. Uh, and yeah, th that's a lot of rigs out there. Are they going to be in the used market in six months or a year? Probably a high degree of those will be. And how long are people going to uh, put up with this. That's the next question. Not being able to get a spot. So, well, let's check in about six months with each other. Uh, RV travel is where you can read Mike Gast. He's going to be reporting on this all this week. And his, uh, his uh, boss, Chuck Woodbury, the pioneer of uh, RV travel, uh, as we know it, <laughs> uh, he's weighing in a lot on it too. And we'll send, uh, we'll put links in uh, all of our show notes for it. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike, Mike. Mike, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch. Thanks. I think that was really informative. I learned a lot from it. And it's nice having somebody with that kind of expertise that can explain it to us. And we want to hear what all of you think out there too. Yeah. The campgrounds aren't necessarily the bad guys in this situation. They're trying, you know, to make money. And when these corporations, as Mike said, buy up a, a mom and pop, oftentimes they buy it because there's adjoining land and they can add more campsites. That's good. Right. Um, but still uh, this whole idea of dynamic pricing, it, it's, it's different. That's not the it's way different. it we used to be. We were spoiled that it was the same price every night of the week. So, Nothing stays the same. No, it doesn't. But you kind of wish it did sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. So uh, what do you guys think about this? Uh, you can reach us a couple of ways. One, uh, send us uh, an email, just Mike and Jen at rvlifestyle.com. We'd love to get your questions. Uh, also, you, we have a voicemail number and you can call that voicemail number. And that number is 586 372 6990. Again, 586-372-6990. We'll be back right after this with the question of the week. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10. When you buy $99 or more in merchandise, you'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. If you've visited an RV park lately, surely, besides all the RVs, you've seen these e-bikes. Jennifer and I are proud e-bike owners, and the e-bike that we chose are rad power bikes. 
America's number one e-bike brand, offering direct-to-consumer pricing on powerful premium electric bikes. Jen and I love our Rad Power bikes. We use them to go around the campground, to explore the area we're in. I have the city bike version. Hers is the step-through model. And those are just two of a whole bunch of different models offered by Rad Power bikes. All of them can reach 20 miles an hour with zero pedaling. But of course, you can also pedal. And you've got five different levels of pedal assist to make the going just a little bit easier and fun. You can go between 20 to 40 miles on a single charge. Now, here's the deal. You can save $75 off if you use the coupon code RV Lifestyle at checkout. Plus, of course, free shipping. Check them out. Radpowerbikes.com. Welcome back to the questions of the week segment of our program. This question was left on our voicemail and it's from Jeff. Hi, Mike and Jen. Here's my question. With the current delivery delays for new motorhomes being as much as 36 months, months, if an RV is ordered this year, 2021, and it can't be delivered for 36 months, will the RV be a 2021 or a 2024? What about the depreciation? Price increases. Thank you, Jeff Baldwin. <laughs> that's a that's a very good question. 2021 or 2024? Well, I think that the price might go up a little bit because obviously they don't have chassis or they would be making them. So when the new chassis come in, you're going to be getting a newer model. So I would expect you might have to pay a little bit more for a newer model. And uh, actually the technology, everything in the rig might be a, just a little bit better, a little bit newer. So yeah. I would think it would be whatever year you get. So if it if it really was a three year wait, you'd be getting a 2024, not mm -hmm. a 2021. But honestly, I don't think you're going to have to wait quite that long. I, I mean, either. I hope it tightens up. You're going to have to wait a year, maybe closer to two, but I don't think three. But at any rate, whatever the current model is, when you when you get delivery, that's the one that you'll get. Whatever they're cranking out on the assembly line, that's what you're going to get. And as Jen said, I you know you'll probably get some improvements too mm -hmm. because, I mean, I think about all the things, how fast this industry is changing, how many improvements there are, how how solar is getting better, how battery technology is improving. Um, they're finding, you know, air conditioning units are starting with less power, so you you don't have to run a generator. And there's just lots of little things that are that are coming because so many people want RVs. They're improving them fast, and that's what you'll get. So. Um, but you'll get the same model here. So that was a question that uh, came in through our uh, voicemail number, which again is 586-372-6990. We love to get the voicemail questions. Um, but we also have a question that came in through our uh, YouTube Ask Us Anything program. Are you all familiar that on Sunday nights at 7 p.m. for an hour, we take your questions, you call in from all of our different channels, and uh, we answer them. So if you got a question, it's contact called, us. It's called Ask Us Anything, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, every Sunday night on YouTube and on Facebook. Here's one of them that came in uh, not long ago. <laughs> the Grumpy Grandpa. Ah, what advice do you have for buying local dealership and servicing local or buying out of state, factory direct, if available, and then local service, pros and cons. Well, you, you can kind of figure out some of those yourself. Um, if you order local, they're going to give you, I think, a little better uh, priority service when you need I would it hope so. because you're a customer. Whereas if you call them up and you say, you know, I need to get in, just human nature is they're going to put their own customers ahead of you. That's not saying that they won't fix it, but that just makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? You know, so uh, now we have bought out of state and uh, we had no problems getting service. You know, it's kind of like you travel around the country a lot. You know, we're on half, three quarters of the time. So often we get our service done when we're somewhere else and we've never not been able to get it. But on a day in day out basis where you're going to have a regular, it's really nice to have a regular mechanic that you work up. 
for our laser travel vans, we drive uh, almost 200 miles across Michigan to get any of the work done on the motorhome part at a dealer in Holland, Michigan that we bought from. We've bought uh, two RV. No, we bought th one. this, this one. We bought this last one through him. The other one we bought to a dealer in New Mexico. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I would probably, if we buy another one uh, from Leisure, we will, we will get it from uh, Holland again, because we've been very happy with their service. So I would always suggest that you look as close as possible to getting it locally, unless they don't have what you want, that you can get it quicker somewhere else. Uh, but all things being equal, local is always better. Again, that came from our Sunday night, Ask Us Anything at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Tune in this week and ask us anything you'd like to ask. Hey, and we also would love to get your questions. We haven't had any of our um, our new YouTube viewers of the podcast send us a video question. Don't you think we should get some? Yeah. Yeah. So you can send us just, you know, get your phone, make a short little video, ask us a question and send it in to us. Email it. Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com. I'll tell you what, the first one I get, the first one I get our video question, I'll send you a free copy of that new uh, printed version of our complete guide to boondocking. Book. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo, yeah, 116 something pages and uh, all about boondocking. I'll send you a free copy. The first one we get that we use, uh, just send us that video question because it'd be really fun. But make sure it's a real question. Don't just say, oh, I want to get your book. But you got to have a real question. We'll answer it and we'll send you a book. So how answer. long will it take me to get my book? Isn't a real question? No, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a real question. But it'll only take you a few days. They got to, but they print them up on demand. So maybe it'll take you a week, but you'll get it. So send us those questions. And now for one of my favorite parts of our podcast, Tom and Patty Burkett take us to all kinds of interesting places. All of those places are off the beaten path. Hi, Mike and Jennifer. On our last visit to Baltimore, our daughter who lives there informed us we'd be going on a day trip to Frederick. Why Frederick, we wanted to know. It turned out she'd been wanting to visit the town for some time. Her boyfriend, who grew up there, always lobbied for something someplace different, and now was her chance. Besides, she said, I found something I think you'll like. That was enough to conv convince us because she shares our travel preference for out-of-the-way surprises. So it was we ended up standing in front of an old Woolworths Five and Dime that was now the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I thought I knew most of what there was to know about Civil War Medicine after countless trips to Gettysburg with 8th grade history classes and hearing the stories of battlefield surgeons hacking off injured legs and arms and throwing them out the windows of the farmhouses that served as frontline hospitals. All true, we discovered, but what a limited view of the transformation undergone by medicine during the course of the war. Diagnosis and treatment, hospital organization and theory, transportation of wounded soldiers, even veterinary practices became much more like what they are today. Much of the story of Civil War medicine is the story of William Alexander Hammond. To start his story at its end, he was court-martialed for irregularities on the purchase of medical furniture, a trumped-up charge based on falsified records. Hammond, both brilliant and unbending, made many enemies in the government bureaucracy of the time, and no few among his own colleagues. He went from his government office to the faculty of Bellevue Hospital to the New York University and then became the first practicing psychiatrist in the USA. He was eventually restored to the rank of Brigadier General in the Army, though he never returned to service. Hammond was a man who based his work on practice and evidence. He began with the treatment of wounded soldiers on the battlefield and instituted a variety of treatment protocols to address wound management and infection control. In tandem with those changes, he designed and created a standard medical service wagon, which contained all the supplies a battlefield doctor might need, organized for fast and sterile access. These practices, though improved over time, are still followed by military medics today. He also redesigned and standardized hospitals, organizing them into wings to prevent the spread of infectious outbreaks throughout the population, and providing strategically placed areas for washing, toileting, and patient care, both to protect the patients and to make treatment efficient. 
The town of Frederick was home to dozens of buildings used as hospitals during the war, and more than 10,000 soldiers were treated there. Hammond's hospital plans were continually adapted to existing buildings, and the emphasis on cleanliness and efficient care was observed in all of them. Hammond designed specialized rail cars to transport wounded soldiers. Litters were suspended from rubber rings to reduce jostling and shock, and a center aisle allowed access by nurses during the journey. Several of these modifications can still be seen in modern ambulances. The museum is well designed with excellent graphics and wall murals to illustrate conditions during the war and has many fascinating artifacts. Among the most interesting are the tools of the battlefield surgeons and veterinarians. Hammond insisted during his tenure as Surgeon General that his field personnel send him all examples of pathology bones, limbs, organs, tissues they came across in order to improve the treatment of our wounded fighters. These grisly parts were the start of the new National Museum of Health and Medicine in nearby Baltimore, a museum with its own fascinating story. Nearby in Washington, D.C. is a sister organization, the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office, with yet another tale to tell. Get the ball rolling, and you just never know where it will lead, out here off the beaten path. So many interesting places, fascinating places. Some of them, the history is kind of, kind of sad, and it's not good, like the Civil War, but fascinating and history that we dare not we forget. never want to forget. Yep. So thanks to the Burkitts. The Burkitts are regulars on the podcast. You can catch them all the time here, and you can see and read many of their reports at rvlifestyle.com. That's our companion travel blog for the podcast, rvlifestyle.com. If you've not been over there, please do. Uh, for those of you watching this podcast on YouTube, please subscribe. Click the little bell icon and uh, then you'll be notified when we have new uh, videos online. For those of you listening to the podcast, please share it with your friends. Let them know that they can subscribe by their favorite podcast app, Stitcher, uh, iTunes, uh, Google, whatever it is. And then you can also read the podcast show notes where we have a lot of details and links at rvlifestyle.com. But that's all we got for you in episode 350. We hope you guys are camping. Yes, get out there, have an adventure, and happy trails.